If you love the Lord, say amen. amen. God is a good God. I'm saying that because today is William's birthday. And he used to say it all the time. And not only William's birthday, but Brother Willie's birthday also. We want to thank God for allowing us to be here another day to worship him in spirit and in truth. Is that all right? Are you happy to be in God's house today? You can be anywhere else that you so choose, but thank God that you're here. Judges chapter 2, beginning with verse 6. The word of God says, when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went everywhere, went every man unto his own inheritance to possess the land. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, son of Nun, a servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. They buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Hedis, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gosh. Notice verse 10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. I want to talk to you today about A manner of life worth living. Do we ever consider whether or not our manner of life is worth living? Worth living to those who are following behind us. In other words, what example do the young people see in you and I? Are we living lives? Do we have a manner of life about ourselves that's to them worth living? Before we go any further, let's together pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for having blessed us with the right exercising of our minds and a reasonable portion of our health and strength to be in this place of gathering that we may together worship you. And now, dear God, we've come to the portion of our worship where we are privileged to hear a word from you. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to understand that the manner of life that we live is extremely important. And though, Heavenly Father, none of us, none of us are perfect, for all have sinned and fallen short of your glory, Yet even still, because you love us so, we, Heavenly Father, simply just want to live our lives for you. Help us to do this. Help us to see from the words of Paul to his son in the faith, Timothy. Help us to see, Heavenly Father, that our lives for you is truly worth living no matter what we go through. We thank you, Lord, and we ask this prayer in faith and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 4, the verses, starting with verse 6. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, and this is going to be his last writing. 
He's giving them final words right here in this text. Final words of encouragement to Timothy. And he's telling Timothy that these are the last times. Is that all right? And I'm here to tell you we're definitely living in the last times. This is the last dispensation and things are just, it's so numbing because whatever we see on the news is not shocking. Because things are just seemingly getting worse and worse. But God is still good. And he's writing to him and he's saying, even in the face of apostasy in the church, because earlier he told him to preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You see, no matter how bad it gets, we need to continue to preach the word. Is that all right? And you have to understand that Paul is writing to encourage Timothy even though he himself is in chains. And his death is about to occur. And he says to him in verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. What he's saying when he says already being offered is he's a libation which was a practice of the pagans in which they would pour oil and wine over the head of a victim before they sacrificed him. So what Paul is saying in a figurative sense is that this had already taken place with him. And all he was waiting for was to be put to death. And he says, my departure is at hand. And what he literally meant in the Greek is that it's a loosing anchor like on a ship. So his view of his death was like he was anticipating it as though he was being bound to this earth. But his release in death was coming. And he was ready to take that final voyage, that eternal voyage. Is that all right? You see, it ain't about this life. It's about the life that's to come, the eternal voyage. Amen. You see, his view of death is one that we all need to strive towards, and that is, I want to be at peace. Is that all right? Death is something that I want to look forward to. You say, do you want to harm yourself? I ain't talking about harming myself right now. Is that all right? I want to make sure I'm giving a proper picture here. But death doesn't fear me, Paul is saying. I'm not fearing death. I'm looking forward to it. Is that all right? You remember in Philippians chapter 1 and the verses 21 through 24, Paul said, For me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I should choose, I cannot tell. For I'm hard pressed between the two. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Amen. Amen. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So Paul wasn't scared. Amen. Death was something that he anticipated and actually look forward to but he's writing to Timothy and his work is now coming and drawing to a close and I'm here to tell you no matter how good you and I do what we do for the Lord there's coming a time when your work will draw to a close but he's expressing though my work is drawing to a close I want to express the blessedness of it all coming to the end because the crowning achievement in our Christian life is the end. We want to be with the Lord, but no one wants to die. Isn't that something? We want, we want to be with the Lord, but no one wants him to come back today. I still got something to do. Hold on, Lord. Amen. 
You see, whether we pass away or whether he comes back first, it's just simply a transition. Y'all hear what I'm saying? You say, well, make it clear. All right. First Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to start with verse 51. It's just simply a transition. You see, whether you, whatever you do, you will live on. You say, well, what about that thing that, that's up here in a casket? That's not you. That's the shell that you're in. But the part that makes you you, the spirit, your mind, that will live on forever. Now, how you live now determines where that's going to be. Is that all right? Y'all remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man in Hades. Is that all right? The realm of the dead. You see, we don't just die and go to heaven or hell. No, there's a place of the dead where we all go into the day of judgment. And the Bible says that in Hades, the rich man lifted up his eyes. And he saw Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom. In other words, down there, you're conscious. You know what's going on. Say, I don't know if I believe that. Then just die. Die and see. Is that all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 51. If you have it, say amen. The Bible says, behold, Paul speaking, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Not everybody's going to die. Some people will be alive when the trumpet sounds and Christ comes back. What a sight that's going to be. But we shall be all changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And that's not Donald Trump. For the trumpet shall sign. This is the real trump. Amen. Amen. And the dead shall be raised, watch this, incorruptible, and we shall be changed for this corruptible. Watch this. This is corruptible. This is going to somebody's graveyard. Is that all right? For this corruptible must put on incorruption. In other words, when Christ comes back, we're going to get our spiritual bodies. That doesn't corrupt any longer. It lasts forever. Can't wait for that body. We spend all our life trying to get this in shape. Y'all can say amen. amen. <laughs> Dieting. Ketones. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Something that won't perish. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. No more death. Is that all right? Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave or Hades, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But watch this. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye what? Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Because sometimes it gets rough, y'all. Sometimes you think you're just spinning your wheels. I'm doing the best I can, Lord, and life is still just coming. But he says, be steadfast and unmovable. Don't let the enemy move you. Always abounding. In the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
Is that all right? Sometimes people want to see how many people you got to see if the ministry is successful. But I ain't worried about how many people. The people that is here, how successful is your life in Christ? That's what really matters. So Paul says with confidence, I'm, I'm looking forward. I'm ready for my departure. But why is he so confident? He says, I have fought a good fight. In the Greek, it actually reads, the good fight I have fought. The good fight. What is the good fight? I'm going to give you the technical definition. The good fight refers to the praiseworthy and noble conflict, combat, and contest that's full of dangers, difficulties, struggles, as in warfare, and contending with an adversary. Anybody know what it's like to contend with an adversary? But it's aimed with a purpose and an end for the cause of Christ. We said a little bit last week, this is a good fight that we're fighting. It's a good fight. Is that all right? First Timothy 6.12, Paul had told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life is that all right <clears throat> lay hold means to seize attain or possess is that all right so watch this go with me to first corinthians chapter 9 real quick and i'm gonna read this from a different translation is that all right he said fight the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life Understand that because the enemy hates your father, he doesn't want to see you at peace with your father. So this is going to be a battle. It's going to be a fight. But he says it's a good fight. It's a praiseworthy fight. It's a noble fight. There's nothing in life we should want to fight more than this good fight of faith. Is that all right? First Corinthians chapter nine, starting with verse 24. If you have a say, man. Now watch what he says about the race and the fight. He says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. In other words, in this fight, fight to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. Is that all right? I discipline my body like an athlete training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Paul is saying, look, man, we entered this fight. We entered this Christian race, not to just be one of the ones in the race. We entered to win. The battle against sin. The fight against the world. Is that all right? The fight against the flesh. And oh man, is that a fight? The fight against Satan. We're in it to win it. But we have to fight it with the proper weapons. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 and verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For the pulling down of strongholds. 
You see, the weapons that God has for us are mighty, and they're able to pull down strongholds, something that's held you since 1980. God is able to pull it down. Is that all right? Because sometimes we become self-defeating and, and say, well, you know, I just, I can't get past this. I can't get over this. But God is saying, I got something for it. If you just trust in me, is that all right? Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You see, we spend so much time trying to fight on our own, thinking I need to have the ability to overcome this. And you can't overcome it by yourself. You tried that. And it does not work. We have to put on the whole armor of God. Is that all right? And watch what it says. Put on the whole armor of God that what? You may be able to stand. Is that all right? Are we getting this? The Bible says, watch this. Loved. Now we are the sons of God. And it doth not appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We shall see him as he is. Oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cast our past home at last, ever to rejoice. Is that all right? We're going to see him as he is. We have to fight the good fight. We got to fight. The question is, how are you holding on? How are you doing in your fight? Are you holding your own? Are you maintaining? Or do they need to stop the fight? Does the fight need to be stopped? Are you getting whooped so bad by the enemy that they need to throw in the towel and stop the fight? We got to keep fighting. Don't quit. And that's what he next says. He says, after he says, I fought the good fight, he says, I finished my course. My course. My course. See, I can't finish your course. You can't finish mine. He said, I finished my course. God's will for my life. Is that all right? You see, we don't understand. We think that sometimes God's will is just for the preacher. It's for the elders or deacons. No, God has a will for your life. Your life matters for God. We all play a part in the church. Is that all right? Don't you know you're not here by accident? Don't you know that God placed the members of the body as it pleased him? So you just didn't jump in here. God placed you in here. Is that all right? Paul said in Galatians 1 and verses 14 and 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 17, he says, I thank God who counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. How good has God been to you that he placed you in his church? But God, you, you know my life. You know I'm not worthy. I want you in my church. But God, I, I slip up sometimes. I, I, I struggle sometimes. I want you in my church. All the things I've done, and you want me? Yes, I want you. See, this race that we have to finish is different from the world's race. In the world's race, only the one who finished first wins the prize. But in this Christian race, all who finish gets a prize. 
all who finish get surprised. You say, well, I, I maybe I feel like I, I'm stumbling around the track. Get up and finish. You say, well, my time may not be good as sisters told. Get up and finish the race. Because no matter what time you finish in, you still get the same prize as the first person who finished. So just get up and finish the race. Say, I got a Charlie horse, a spiritual Charlie horse. Get up. Just carry that Charlie horse across the finish line. Amen. Made the, the, the Charlie horse may be your family. Carry it across the line. Is that all right? Amen. You see, things happen. No matter how good you fight, no matter how fast you run, things happen in this race. Ecclesiastes 9.11 says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift. Then later on he says, time and chance happens to us all. Because sometimes when you run in this race, you think, well, why is this happening to me? Time and chance happens to us all. Is that all right? You say, well, why does this, why did I have to get dealt this bad hand? Play your hand you got. No, we ain't talking about spades, but play the hand you got. Because even if I ain't got but just one and a half book, I can set you. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Finish the race. Maybe you only got a possible. Finish the race. Finish the race. Is that all right? Understand there's some things, like we said last week, there's some things in this race you're just going to have to lay aside. Whenever you watch track, what, what do they got on? They got on the least amount they got on. Sometimes they got on too little. So you can see some things. But they don't want anything hindering them. They want to be able to run as fast as they can. Is that all right? And in this race, according to Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, we have to lay aside the sin and the weights that so easily beset us. Is that all right? Whatever you have in your life, I don't care how good it is, if it's hindering your relationship with the Lord, pray about it. Pray about it. You say, well, this is really, ain't nothing more important than your soul. But this is something that I got to do. God is, he put this, in, God didn't put nothing in your life that's going to hinder your relationship with him. Well, God, I know I got to work. He gave you the job. He knows you got to work. But don't put the job above him. We're trying to teach our young kids, our young children. I'm sorry. They get mad at me when I say kids. We're trying to teach them. Listen. When you choose a career, you make sure that they know, listen, I'm not free on Sundays. That's the Lord's day, and I'm not free. You ask any of your Jewish friends. They don't work on Saturday. And the holy days that they respect, they're not going to work on them. They make that known up front. Is that all right? Guess what? We settle for anything. Well, it's a job. I got to get this job. Got to get this job. Uh, I got to work on Sunday. Uh, okay, I need the job. I got to take the job. No. God will bless you with a job. Wait on the Lord. He'll give you what you need. The, the question is, do you trust him? Do you trust him? So he says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. Last but not least, he says, I've kept the faith. The faith. Ephesians 4, 5. One faith. Jude 3. Contend for the faith. 
faith in that context is talking about a system of belief that's been given. And Christ has only given one system of belief for all men to come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. But the religious world teaches any system will do. Jesus gave one system. But the religious world says any system will do. There's only one. The doctrine of Christ. If anyone come unto you and bring not this doctrine, Receive them not into your house, neither bid them God's speed. For him that biddeth them God's speed is partaker of their evil deeds. Well, I, I just don't believe that God would be like that. God is love. We're all worshiping God. No matter what church you go to, we're all worshiping God. We're all going. Well, guess what? Just like there was one ark, there's one church. Just like Noah had to follow the pattern to a T that God gave him. Well, I don't want to use gopher wood. I want to use cherry. Well, that boat would have sank. Well, I don't need to get baptized. I just, I'll just be sprinkled. Do what God has prescribed. If you want to know how particular God is, just read the Old Testament. Nadab and Abihu, take a look at them. They offered a strange fire in worship, something that they thought would be good. God killed them on the spot. You don't offer God what he didn't tell you to give him. Go back to Cain and Abel. Is that all right? They both brought an offering. Is that all right? But God had respect unto Abel's offering, but not unto Cain's. Say, why not? Because the Bible says in Hebrews 11, Cain offered his, or Abel offered his by faith. What does that mean? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. He gave God what God asked him for. And that's why God said to Cain, don't you know how to do right? But Cain, like many people today, they want to offer God what they want to offer God. <clears throat> Take this, God. You accept it. He says, I kept the faith to keep guard, to observe, refers to one who shows themselves to be actually holding a thing fast. Tim, first or Second Timothy chapter one, and the verses twelve through fourteen. Paul told Timothy, "For this reason, being pointed." Preacher, he's talking about being appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. He says, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Watch what he says. That, th that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Keep it. Don't you know that God has entrusted each of us with his word? How faithful are you keeping it? Do you allow anyone to persuade you, to cause you to compromise from what, from what God has given us? Is that all right? Paul is saying, listen, I wasn't just faithful in di discharging 
this gospel and this doctrine as my duty, but I myself observed it and kept it in my life. To keep the faith means in your duty and in your life. Is that all right? Your duty and your life. In other words, just don't tell the truth, live the truth. Is that all right? People love to tell the truth, but can you live it? You see, tonight we'll be talking about the crown that awaits us. But keeping the faith, fighting a good fight, finishing our course, we have to understand a manner of life that's worth living. Is that all right? But sometimes we have a problem. And the problem is this. Sometimes I don't understand that the life that God has called for me is worth living because I've yet to come to understand what I really have talked about this a little yesterday in our Saturday classes and we asked the question do you really understand what you and I have in Christ Jesus do you know what you have because if you truly understood what you really have well first of all guess what unless I get into his word then I, won't, I don't know what I have But once I grow closer and closer to him through understanding his word and growing closer to him, understanding what I have, the treasure that's in this earthen vessel, I have mercy in Christ Jesus. Mercy, meaning that I deserve something, but because of his mercy, he kept it from me. I have grace in Christ Jesus, meaning that he gave me something I didn't deserve. But by his grace, he said, you can have it. I have the forgiveness of my sins. You want to think for a second how many sins you got? I don't want to do that. But in Christ, he says, you've been justified. And I love the meaning of justification because it means as if it never happened. Lord, have mercy. If we can look at one another and things we've done to one another as if it never happened, Lord, have mercy. If we can just have the mind of Christ. And if I've done you wrong, you, you look at me as if it never happened. God has been good to me. And whether you know it or not, he's been good to you. And all he's asking us is to make sure we understand that the life, manner of life like our brother Paul, is worth living. You say this. Man, he was beat within an inch of his life. He was put in prison. He was stoned. And that's worth living? That's worth living. When it's all said and done, nothing will matter but your relationship with Christ. Won't matter where you worked, where you lived, how much money you had in the bank. Did you have a relationship with the master? The Bible calls him our advocate. You see, we all got a court date with God. And we all need some representation. And I'm here to tell you, 
If you go to this court date without Jesus as your advocate, as your representation, you're going to lose this case. Because guess what? You're guilty. I'm guilty. The preponderance of the evidence is beyond a reasonable doubt. But the advocate says to the judge, the father, he or she is with me. Thank you, Jesus. He or she is with me. I paid the price. And the father says, innocent. Thank you, Jesus. God has been too good. And we need to live such lives that these young people. I asked Rudy the other day. She didn't understand me, firstly. But I said, Rudy, do we, does Janine and I, does our life have an impact on you? And how you will hold as you grow older? Will it impact you? She said, yeah. So guess what? I've resolved that no matter what I got to go through. And guess what? Some things she's got to see. She's got to see when it's rough. She's got to see when things ain't all good. So that she can know that God is good and God is able. So I don't, we don't keep her from not seeing the bad times. Because God is better than whatever bad time you can have. Is that all right? I've said enough. If you're here today and you're without Christ, man, no matter what type of life you're living, without Christ, it won't matter. You can come right now, having heard the word of God, do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? Are you willing to turn from your current path of life and turn to God. That's what repentance is. Repentance is not saying I'm sorry. Repentance is not saying, well, I'm going to get it together. Repentance is really being humble and saying, God, I can't get it together. I need you to help me turn. That's what true repentance is. Then confess before the audience. Because Christ, when he confessed he was the son of God, they killed him for it. But confession is unto salvation, the Bible says, Romans 10, Romans 10, Amen. verse 10. Unto salvation. Then, the final act of obedience is being buried in baptism for the remission of sins. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You see, why wouldn't you want to have your slate cleaned. Yeah. Newness of life. Now we can be taught to live faithful unto death. You're going to have in this race your obstacles. You're going to have your pitfalls. But God is able yeah. if you just trust in him. For those of us who have obeyed the gospel and we know for a fact because we know, then God knows. God already knows whether you know or not. But if you know your life, it's not in a manner that God is pleased with, then let's come together. Let's pray for one another. Let's ask God to help us. Is that all right? Consider.